<clears throat> then Allah subhanahu wa said in another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa said that Shaitan said, Verily, I will misguide most of them by my voice. Shaitan said, he tells us what type of tricks he's going to use. Okay. Shaitan said, I will deceive them with my voice, with my sound. We're told in the top seer that the voice or the sound of Shaitan is through the music. So let's understand what's going on. This is told to us in the top seer, right? Of Ibn Kathir. By Ibn Abbas, Ibn Abbas, Ul, Ibn Ayyad, so forth and so on. So when we know these realities, when we understand these realities, right, we understand what's going on. He said, I will tempt them with my voice. And we're told that his, the voice of Shaitan is through the music. In one of the hadiths, we're told that Shaitan was asked, how do you call the people how do you give dawah to the people? How do you call people to what it is that you want them to do? He said, I use music. <coughs> music is my dawah. The dawah of shaitan is through the music. Shaitan calls you through the music. And he uses certain people in the music industry to be his shared team. In chapter 6, verse 112. And again, we're using our dalil. We're showing our proofs, our points, and our evidence as to what it is that we're talking about. We're not just talking out of the side of our neck. Allah says in chapter 6, verse 112. <clears throat> Allah says, I hope to be loved, Mr. Tarabajim. And verily we have appointed for every prophet enemies among the men and the jinn, inspiring one another with adorned speech as a deception. Read that again. And verily we have appointed for every prophet enemies. Shantin among men and the jinn inspiring one another, helping each other out. But the cold thing about it is that the word that Allah used is you he ba'adukum ba'aduhum. You he, this word means revelation. Wahi. Just like the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gets wahi, he gets revelation, he gets inspiration from Allah. Allah says that the shaitan and the shaitan, they get inspiration, they get wahi, they get revelation from shaitan. Understand that? Inspiring one another with adorned speech and deception. So we're talking about in this ayah going into the top seer. It said this is talking about the poets or the rappers or the singers. They get inspiration from Shaitan to help them in their speech, to help them in their spit, to help them in their singing, to help them in their rapping. They get inspiration from Shaitan. They got a jinn helping them. Right? Some of these rappers, what do they do? They want to get high. They drink. Right? They drink that, what? Fire water. They drink that gin. They got a whole drink called gin. Gin will make you sin. Huh? Word game. Right in front of my face. I need some of that naughty head. Need some of that gin. That gin will make you sin. Clear water, ain't it? Clear. Right? They say gin will make you sin. Who gonna make you sin? The gin gonna make you sin. Say Thompson, I'm gonna make you sin. Right? So you put these entities into your body. Most of these rappers, they're going to do some type of drug. Right? Methamphetamine, cocaine, mollies, ecstasy, herb, drink. Right? They go into the studio, they got to get high first. Right? To do what? To conjure the spirits. I rap better. I talk a little bit better when I got some of that thing thing up in me. You know what I'm saying? 
I got to get that up in me. Right? When you see somebody that's afflicted by a gin, whatever, say, Scotty got his body. Scotty got his body. No, the gin got his body. Right? They got people to be rapping for hours. Man, how did he come up with the words? The gin helped him. Man, how did he come up with that beat? Man, that's like a miracle. A miracle rap. How did he come up with that? The gin helped him. <coughs> we know today, you can Google it. It's very simple. Google it. The music industry and the devil. About two years ago, I seen a clip on YouTube. There was a person that worked for the music industry, and he said that when they make a master, this is coming from a white person, so you know it's true. He said after they finish an album, they take the master, they go into the room, and he said they call 12 or 13 witches and warlocks. Ooh. I'm not stuttering. Said they take this master into a room called 12 or 13 witches and warlocks and they do some type of incantation or some type of spell on the music so that when the people hear it, they go into some type of swoon or there's magic done on them to increase the record sales. Allah said, man, inspiring one another in speech for deception. Rihanna, Beyonce, Sierra, all these women, what they doing? They deceiving the women. They got everybody, what? Born with Shaitan. You in that music industry. You work with Shaitan. You selling your soul. How many videos do you see? Oh, he sold his soul. Oh, he sold his soul to the devil. Right? Because you're dealing with the jinn. See, when you worship the devil, just like when Jesus, it said that Jesus was, was tempted for 40 days. Tempted by who? Tempted by the devil. What did the devil say? Worship me or bow down to me, I'll give you all of this. Same thing with these rappers. You worship me, do my bidding, do what I ask you to do, become a homosexual, faggot, lesbian, whatever, advocate this to the people so they can kill themselves. I'll give you all of this. Right? What did we learn when we was kids? The genie and the lamp. Right? The genie in the bottle. Right? Having it in cartoons, man, we going around looking for a bottle. I get three wishes. Have me as a little kid looking for a bottle. I can't, man, I wish I could find me a genie bottle. I want three wishes. Get whatever I want. Ready to sell our soul. <clears throat> How many movies have you seen with the going to somebody that's in the music industry? They got a movie called Crossroads. They got a movie called Crossroads. And what's the guy, the, the, the karate kid, Ralph Macchio. Oh. And he makes a deal with the devil to become the best guitarist. Right? To become the best guitarist. So he had to sell his soul to the devil. Right? Just like a lot of these people in the music industry, right? Getting revelation from the devil, going into a swoon, making a pact, right? Adoring speech. Right, be dazzling speech to deceive the people. So Shaitan said, I will use my voice. I will deceive the people with my voice. How do you do it? With the music. I use the shantine, I use the men, I use the women, right? I inspire them, I give them inspiration, I give them all the glitz and glamour, I give them everything that they need, right? They have that whole package to deceive the people, right? Then Allah Quran said, Shaitan said, I will be with them in their money. I will be with them in their money. Their haram, their haram earnings. I will mix with them in their money. Oh man, it's not rebuy. It's not interest. Well, you know it's a different type of thing, and you can do it. But well, we're here in America, so we can. Oh man, we're gonna flip this. Well, I gotta get it, Google. He said, I will intertwine with them with their money. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said, there is no sadaqa on ill-gotten gain. Well, I'm going to flip this real quick because I need this. I'm going to get this. I'm going to give sadaqa to the masjid. And then, you know, I'm going to get that thing I need. And then I'm cool. 
The Prophet Muhammad so -so said, there is no sadaqa on ill-gotten gain. Even with regards to a wife that knows, and this is in the hadith, if a wife knows that her husband is getting money from haram earnings, it's haram for her to take from me. If she takes from it, the kids take from it, all of them are involved in the haram. You can't even take the haram money and mix it with your halal money. It all becomes tainted now. All from Hadi. So we got to make sure that our money is halal. We don't allow shaitan to mix with our money. Our money dealings. How we deal in the marketplace, right? We got to be fair. We can't be unjust. We can't use fake weight and all of that other stuff. Be deceptive. All of that. Then Shaitan said, I will mix with them with their children. How does Shaitan mix with the children? The Prophet Muhammad some said that when a man and a wife, when they have intercourse, that you should say a certain type of dua before you have intercourse with your wife. Oh Allah, protect me and my wife from anything that comes from this, our offspring. <coughs> protect Shaitan from our offspring. Right? And then when they make this dua, Shaitan won't be able to harm the offspring. He said, but those that don't do this dua, that when the man, when he ejaculates, it says Shaitan mixes in with the semen. And then mixes in with the kid, with the formation of the child. Hadi. So we just we talking about Muslim parents or Muslim, you know what I'm saying, a uh, 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 husband and wife that don't do this dua. What about the children that are born out of wedlock? Right? Shaitan can mix with a child. Not saying that a child is born out of wedlock that, that cannot be righteous. There are many people that became righteous. But we're told that Shaitan said this is how he mixes with the children. You have a child, and you're like, man, what's wrong with him? But he acting like Damien. What's wrong with that child acting like a devil? Well, how is he conceived? What was the husband doing? What was the mama doing? Were they doing drugs? Were they drinking? Because all of that mixes with the child. You had genes involved. The Prophet Muhammad some said <coughs> that many of those that will follow the Dajjal, Many of those that will follow the Dajjal, the Antichrist, will be the Jews and the Christians and the children that were born out of wedlock. This is what the Prophet said. So we're going to be very careful and protect our children from Shaitan. Right? We're told that the only child that Shaitan couldn't touch when he was born was Isa a.s. Allah protected Isa a.s. from even being touched by Shaitan. We're told that when every child is born, that Shaitan touches the child and makes the child cry. That's why the child cries. Because Shaitan touches that child. But we're told that the only child that Shaitan did not touch was Isa a.s. So these are some of the ways that Shaitan said that he would try to deceive us. And again, all of this is dealing with the jinn, the unseen. Okay? All of this is dealing with the jinn. All of this is dealing with the unseen. All of these are realities that we must know. Number one, if we don't know these things, then we won't know what's going, what we're up against. Right? Number two, we don't have knowledge of this. We won't know how to protect ourselves from this. They got a lot of stuff going on. Shaitan said he's going to do a lot of things. He's looking at us. He's watching us. He intertwines with certain people. He gives, you know what I'm saying, certain people revelation. Right? He helps them out in their speech. They spit. <coughs> etc., etc. The Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa said in another hadith, he said, bedazzling speech is tantamount to magic <coughs> be dazzling speech somebody got gift to gab right he talks real well as well just have everybody just mesmerized like Farrakhan <laughs> he said be dazzling speech is tantamount to magic 
right? You could be doing magic on people with your spit, right? Shaitan was the best spitter. He used bedazzling speech to Adam and Eve, got him kicked out of paradise, right? By his spit. We think we got spit, right? We think we got gift to gab. We think we got yappers. No. Shaitan, he's Al-Galur. He's the grand deceiver. He got Adam and Eve kicked out of paradise just by talking to him. Talk real slick to him. Well, look, man, you know what I'm saying? And Allah already told him, don't go to that tree. Shaitan said, look, man, let me tell you something, baby. You know, you, you, the only reason why he do that, man, you know what I'm saying? You know, he'll be immortal and all that. He'll be like an angel and all that stuff. Man. He spit at him. Just by spit. Just like Allah spoke said on the day of judgment, when those that go to the hellfire, they'll blame Shaitan. Shaitan will say, don't blame me today. <clears throat> don't blame me. I didn't have no power of you. All I did was spit at you. I promised you, but I'm a liar. Allah promised you, and the promise of Allah is true. You followed me. I didn't tell you to follow me. I didn't make you follow me. All I did was spit at you. But Allah promised you, his word is true. So don't blame me. Blame yourself today. Okay? Real quick. We have another ayat in the Quran, chapter 2, verse 102. Again, talking about the jinn. Because like we said, bedazzling speech is tantamount to magic. So now we're going to talk about the subject matter of magic. Allah says in chapter 2, verse 102, Allah talks about the land of Babylon. Allah talks about the two angels, Harut and Marut. <coughs> Babylon was in the land of Ur, the land of Iraq. Right? Babylon was in the land of Iraq, the land of Ur. Who was the emperor in the land of Babylon back in the day? Nimrod. Nimrod. Remember Nimrod? Nimrod was from what lineage? Cush, Ham. So Nimrod was what? Okay. So the people of Babylon, the original people of Ur, the original people of Iraq were what? Okay. So when we start talking about Babylon and magic and all of that, Babylon, these were black people. Black people. So Allah talks about Babylon, and he talks about the two angels, Harut and Marut. Right? And he said that they didn't teach the people magic. Suleiman didn't do magic. It was the shared team that taught people magic. It was the jinn that taught people magic. Right? So Allah spoke to us, tell us about magic. In the time of Suleiman and Islam, <coughs> They tried to accuse Suleiman and Islam of magic. But Suleiman and Islam was a prophet. And Suleiman and Islam had control of the jinn. He didn't use the jinn to do magic. Allah gave him mastery over the jinn. They were under his leadership. Allah said he called them to dive, go into the ocean, pull out pearls and rubies and diamonds. That's why Suleiman and Islam had the best kingdom ever. Suleiman alayhi salam had the best kingdom ever in the world. Remember the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam was making, he was making salat. And in the middle of the salat, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam did like this. Right, so after the salat, they said, Ya Rasulullah, we saw you grab out and do like this. They said, what did you do? He said there was a jinn named Khanzab. <coughs> there was a jinn named Khanzab, a jinn. And he was trying to distract me in my salat, so I grabbed him by his throat. <laughs> he said, I grabbed this gin by his throat. He said, I could still feel the wetness of his tongue on my hand. That's what I choked him out. <laughs> right? He said, had it not been for the dua of Suleiman and Salam, I would have took that gin and tied him on one of the pillars of the Kaaba and had the little kids throw rocks at him. He said, but doing Suleiman and Islam had control of the jizz, and he made dua to Allah, oh Allah, do not allow anybody to have a kingdom like mine. So he let the jinn go. But Suleiman and Islam had control of the jinns. Remember when Suleiman and Islam he heard about Bilqis? 
Remember the bird said, the bird was missing. The bird came back and said, man, where was you at? I came from a land. There was a people. They were worshiping the sun. There was a lady with a kingdom like no other kingdom. Who was this lady? The queen of Sheba, Bill Peace. Where was her kingdom? It said, uh, Ethiopia, Sudan, Eritrea, Yemen, and southern part of Saudi Arabia. So Bill Keats, this African queen, the queen of Sheba, her kingdom extended into Yemen. That's why some people from Yemen, they claim lineage to, to uh, the queen of Sheba. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Here they go. Ask them and see if they'll tell you. They'll tell you. You got to ask them, though. You got to ask the right question. Hold on. Hold on. So when Suleiman and Salam, he heard about this woman, right? He said, which one of you jinn will go get her throne for me? Right? One of the jinn said, I'll go get it before you raise up from the sea. Then the other jinn said, if I get it before the blinking of a light. So the jinn, it, it traveled all the way from the land of Canaan, all the land of Palestine, all the way to the land of Ethiopia, Sudan, Eritrea, wherever she was at, grabbed her throne and brought it all the way back in the blinking of an eye. That's how powerful the jinns are. Suleiman al Islam, he had power over the jinns. He had control over the jinns. That's why his kingdom was the most powerful. He had things in his kingdom. He had ornaments. He had jewelry that other people never even seen before. Because they were able to take the jinns, make them go all over the world, go into the ocean, pull out stuff that people they'd never seen before. Right? We also have another hadith with regards to Suleiman alayhi salam. The flying carpet. Oh, that's the best thing I would have seen. The flying carpet. Hadith, tafsir. Allah said in the Quran that one morning travel for the regular person compared to Suleiman, 30 days. One afternoon travel, right, of a normal person compared to Suleiman, another 30 days. So it said that one day travel for Suleiman and Islam would be 60 days travel for the regular person. It said Suleiman and Islam, he had what? Control of the wind. He had control of the wind, he had control of the jinn. We're told in Tafsir that Suleiman and Islam had a carpet. And he would put his whole army on that carpet. <coughs> and that carpet would fly to different places of the regions of the world. <coughs> Tafsir. <coughs> so a lot of these cartoons, Aladdin, Aladdin, the carpet, the flying carpet, the genie in the lamp, and all these things we see in the cartoons, is real. They made it into a cartoon. Suleiman and Islam had a carpet that he would put his whole army, his whole people of the palace on. That's how big the carpet was. And this carpet would fly. It traveled to all parts of the world to go conquer different parts of the world. That's why his kingdom was the best kingdom. So Suleiman and Islam had a flying carpet. Suleiman and Islam had control of the jinn. Okay? But what people do today is magic. Anything dealing with magic is dealing with the jinn. Whenever you have some type of relationship, some type of correlation with the jinn, you're dealing with magic. You're dealing with the kahin. <coughs> the soothsayers, the fortune tellers. Right? You gotta, you know, sacrifice something. You gotta do some type of blood or do some type of debauchery or whatever it may be. This is dealing with the jinn. Right? And the last one I said, and those that deal with magic, whether it's black magic, blue magic, yellow magic, pink magic, blue magic, whatever type of magic, magic number nine, I love you magic. I want him to love me magic. I don't want him to leave magic. Any type of that, you put a roof, some type of food magic, put something in the food or whatever it may be. Any type of magic, the last one I said, they'll be in the hellfire. The punishment for magic in Islam is death. The punishment for magic in Islam is death. Okay? One more thing, a couple more things before we end out, inshallah. 
We're told by Ibn Abbas that the jinns reside in the statues. In Islam, it's haram to do figurines and statues and stuff like that. And Ibn Abbas, he said that the jinns, they reside in the statues. You ever see sometimes when there might be a statue or there might be some type of idol and the people put the food in front of that idol? <coughs> <clears throat> and that idol looks like it's eating the food, right? It's because there's jinns in the idol. There's jinns. It's not that, oh, it's a miracle. No, there's jinns doing magic. They're playing with the people. Okay? So Ibn Abbas said that the statues and the figurines, that the jinns reside. They live in the statues. <clears throat> so Ali ibn Ali said, destroy, debase, deface all of the statues and figurines. Right? In Islam, we don't have no idols. We don't have no pictures. We don't have no statues. We don't have no statue of no little cat. We don't have no figurine of no little cat. We don't have no pictures in the house. Right? The jinn could be in the pictures. We don't wear uh, any clothes with pictures on it. All this going to the jinn. Right? All this is believing in the unseen. Right? The pictures and so forth and so on. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, those that are the most uh, uh, punished are those that are the picture makers, the statue makers. Because Allah Subh'ala will ask that person, are you competing with me? Are you competing with me? You try to compete with me? They were told that on the day of judgment that those that drew pictures, those that did figurines and all of that stuff, Allah will say, now blow the ruh into that thing that you created. Blow the ruh, blow a soul into that thing that you made. They won't be able to do it. Then Allah will blow a roh. Allah will blow a soul into that thing that that person drew or what that person fashioned with his hands. And that thing will become alive and that thing will punish the person that drew it or made it. So all these people drawing pictures of He-Man and strong people with spikes and all that. Allah will make them things come to life and that thing will torture that person. Man, they're in the hellfire. This is a reality. Again, dealing with jinn. And real quick, before we end out, like I said, we can talk about this for hours and hours and hours. But I just want to give you a little bit of information with regards to the jinn. How do we protect ourselves with jinn? Man, Surah the Falak and Surah the Nas. Surah the Falak and Surah the Nas, the Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu he was bewitched by the Jews. There was a Jew that took some of the hair of the Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, again, that concept of, man, don't let nobody get your hair when you cut your hair and they can do magic on it. That's real. Okay? The Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he had long hair. He had four braids. He used to wear four braids in his hair. He had long hair, don't care. Parted his hair in the middle and had four plaits. He used to put honey on the tips of his braids. Sahih Hadi, I'm not saying nothing. I'm not making nothing up. So the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of the Jews took some of the hair out of the comb of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and did magic on it. Okay, we're going to end with this last hadith. He did magic on it to the point that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam thought that he was doing something, but he wasn't doing it. He thought he was sleeping with his wives or he didn't know which house he was at, but he was in a swoon. And so one day he was laying down and the angel said, the two angels came and they were looking over him and they said, well, what happened to him? They said, oh, he's been bewitched. Well, how did he get bewitched? He said, oh, they took from his comb and this and this and that. Where is the comb? Oh, it's in that water well. So when the Prophet Muhammad some of the woke up, <coughs> they went to the water well. They found the comb. They took all the knots and stuff out of it, right? Once they took, they broke the spell or whatever, then the Prophet some of went back to normal. And then Allah spoke Allah revealed, Allah sat down, sort of the falak, sort of the nas, and he said, these will be a protection for magic, okay? So inshallah, just on a nutshell today, just a little bit of something, something today with regards to the jinn, with regards to the magic. Anything dealing with magic is dealing with the jinn. <clears throat> you dealing with the jinn, you dealing with shaitan. Okay? Alhamdulillah, whatever that means. One question, I'm going to end it out. So. <clears throat> I got you, bro. Come on.